Yeah, we're continuing in our church series. This is going to be the last one. And we've covered a whole bunch of the different components of our Sunday service. We've looked at singing. We've looked at the offering and the announcements. Last week we looked at teaching. And today we're covering prayer manifestations. And we intentionally went out of order because today, as it turns out, is Pentecost. And... Pentecost is the day in which we remember the Holy Spirit being poured out on the people of God, on the first generation Christians, and that was accompanied with speaking in tongues. So it seemed like if we're going to talk about prayer and manifestations, today would be a good day to do it. So what I plan to do then is to cover basically two parts. I'm going to talk about prayer, and then I'm going to talk about manifestations. For both, what I want to do is give you a couple of verses to give you the, the background, sort of like the thought process, what's behind uh, how, how we think about this, and then also give you some practical guidelines. And uh, I also have the practical guidelines in the program if you got one this morning. All right, so to start with, let's look at Psalm 106. I'm just going to show you this from the screen, and then... Um, We'll go to the next scripture. So Psalm 106, 19 to 23 says, They made a calf in Horeb and worshipped a metal image. They exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. Therefore, he said he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him, to turn away his wrath from destroying them. Strange place to start in talking about prayer. A little strange. I don't know. I love this verse, though. It's, it's, so, it's so powerful to me because it says that God was angry with his people. God is a, God, is a, he's a holy God. He's, he has wrath. You don't want to mess with God. He's not Santa Claus. He's not a teddy bear. And he's certainly not an ATM machine. Uh, so the people had cheated on God. They had worshipped the golden calf. A horrible moment in Israelite history. And what happened? God said, I'm going to destroy these people. But then we read, let me get my little highlighter out here. How about blue? Then we read, it says, Therefore he said he would destroy them. Had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him. You know what that tells me? That tells me that the prayer of Moses changed the action of God. This is such a powerful verse about prayer. Those of you who, who are familiar with the, the incident here, you know what happened. What happened is God said, I'm going to destroy these people. They're, they're stiff-necked. They're worshiping other gods. He had just given them the Ten Commandments. They're, they're still probably a little bit wet from going through the Red Sea. Well, I guess they didn't get wet, wet on the way. But, you know, they had just been through that experience. They get to the mountain, and the mountain's on fire, and, and God reveals himself in this Incredible way to them, gives them the Ten Commandments. What's the first commandment? I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. Second commandment, don't make a graven image. So what do they do? Moses is up on the mountain for 40 days. They say, we don't know what happened to this guy. He went on a hike. He never came home. Let's make a golden calf. God said, that's it. We just, we need it. I, God's patient. He's like, you know, I've got another thousand years. We can, we can start something, right? He's always got another thousand years, God. So um, he says to Moses, well, I'm just going to start over with you. You know, these people, you know, they're, they're really just uh, disobedient. You know, they're, they're bad news, these people. I've, you know, God can see their hearts. It's not like it's just a snap judgment, like, I don't like you. I mean, he really, they really were bad. And um, Moses says, don't do it. And he prays to God, and he says, God, if you do it, then the nations will hear, they'll think... They'll think you brought them out here to destroy them. And, you know, didn't you say that you're merciful and gracious and slow to anger? And Moses starts praying, and it says in this scripture here that God would destroy them. He was going to destroy them had not Moses stood in the breach. That tells me that you have the ability, the potential to stand in the breach. 
for other people in your prayers. And that you could potentially change the mind of God. That you could affect the one who holds the world in his hands. <laughs> Prayer is powerful. All right, let's look at another scripture. This is 1 Chronicles 29. 1 Chronicles 29, verse 10. And uh, go ahead and flip there in your Bible or on your phone. Or if you have it memorized, you know, just like call to mind that section of the Bible. This is a section where David had uh, just requested people to give offerings because he wanted to build a temple. He wanted to build a house for God. And people came with these overwhelming number of contributions. And so David here utters his prayer. And we read in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 10, it says, Therefore, David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, or it's the Hebrew name of God, Yahweh there. Blessed are you, O Yahweh, the God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Yours, O Yahweh, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Yahweh, and you are exalted as head above all. What would you call this kind of speech? Praise, yeah. I think this is a good prayer for us to think about when it comes to how you contribute during the Sunday service, those of you who, who pray and who, who want to pray out loud, this is a good prayer for you to think about. I mean, there's lots of good prayers in the Bible, right? But I, I, like, I like how this one begins with praise because it reminds me of so many of the other prayers. Like when Jesus said uh, to pray in this way, he said, How, uh, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. You know, he starts with directing the attention to God, to where God's located. To, to speaking well of God. And I think this, this prayer beautifully does that as well. He says in verse 10 that God is blessed. He's a father forever. Verse 11, he says that God has, to him is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Whew. Some ammunition for your prayer life right there. Um, his is the kingdom. Verse 12, both riches and honor come from you and you rule over all. In your hand is power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. Now, why do you think David praised God in the beginning of his prayer? Do you think it's because God has a fragile ego? And he just always has to be told how great he is? <laughs> do you think God is a megalomaniac and he just, he just needs reassurance all the time? Like, oh, please... You know, Praise me a little more. No, no, God, God was fine before any of us existed. He's, he's going to be fine afterwards. You know, he's a relational God. Yes, he cares about us. Yes, but like he, he just doesn't really need much, you know. And so what is this praise all about? Well, I think praise does two things. One, I think it does bless God. Anybody that gets praised is blessed by that praise. You know, if you, if, you, if you say to somebody, you did a great job with that, I'm really proud of you, or I was really impressed by how you did that, it makes you, the other person feel good. We're made in God's image. I think there is a sense in which God enjoys and is blessed by praise. Um, but another thing it does is, is it gets our heads straight in prayer, that we remember whom it is we are speaking to. You know, and I think that's a good thing for us when we start our prayers, so I, I recommend this as a habit for you to consider. When you go to pray, start with praise. Start with telling God how great He is. Start with talking about what He's done or His character. And then in verse 14, David says, But who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, and of your own have we given you. For we are strangers before you and sojourners, as all our fathers were, our days on the earth are like a shadow, and there is no abiding. Verse 16, O Yahweh, our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. I know, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure and uprightness in the uprightness of my heart. I have freely offered all these things, and now I have seen your people who are present here offering freely and joyously 
to you. So he moves, he moves to thanksgiving. He's very thankful for God and for what the people have given to God. And he's talking, and, and that's good for you to do too. You know, there's praise, which is just talking about how awesome God is. And then there's thanksgiving, which is talking about uh, what God has done for you. Those are two different things. God, you are to be praised. You are highest above the heavens and the earth. You are all powerful and mighty. Let's praise. Thank you for my wonderful wife and children. Thank you for providing for my needs. That's thanks, right? So praise and thanks, those are two great in- ingredients for your prayer. It says in Philippians, <clears throat> Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. You want to ask God for something? I want to ask God for stuff all the time. Praise Him, thank Him, and then ask Him for something. Look, this is not a law, okay? I'm just giving you a recommendation based on what we read here and how David does it. Look at verse 18. (coughs) O Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct Keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts toward you. So he's praying that God would help the people to be faithful. He's asking for something. This is called intercessory prayer. God, I pray that you watch over my kids when they go to school. God, I pray that you heal my friend or my loved one who is suffering from a sickness. Right? That's intercessory prayer. It's praying for someone else. That's what David's doing here. Verse 19, grant to Solomon, my son, a whole heart that he may keep your commandments, your testimonies, and your statutes, performing all that he may build the palace for which I have made provision. So, he petitions. And you know what? Petition is an important part of prayer. Asking God for things is an important part of prayer. God wants you to ask him for things. God does not say to himself, when you ask for something the 50th time, (sighs) <sighs> I'm so tired of hearing you ask me for that. In fact, it's the opposite. Jesus once told a story about a widow who was, was mistreated, and she went to the judge day in and day out, and she said, avenge me, avenge me. I've been a victim of injustice, avenge me. And the judge didn't care about people or God, but he said, lest this woman wear me down, I will avenge her. Jesus told that story. It's a made-up story. It's a parable. He told that to illustrate how you're supposed to be in prayer. You're supposed to be like that widow. Annoying. (laughs) Right? Annoy God with your prayers. Please. He can handle it. And that's a petition. All right. So most churches do not allow for congregational praying. It's weird that we do it here. I recognize that. I've been to other churches. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I've been to other churches, and I, and I noticed that it's, it's not very common. Someone will pray, sure. But to allow anybody to pray, that's risky. That is risky, because you never know what's going to happen. I don't know if you know this, but we didn't plan like who would be allowed to pray today. The people who decided to pray stood and they prayed. So there's a lot of trust involved in that. Um, And I cherish this practice. I think it's something to be proud of. I think it's cool. I think it's cool and unusual. Not cruel and unusual, but cool and unusual. (laughs) And it's when you get to hear what's on people's hearts, too. Right? Right? It's when you, when, you, when you get to really uh, bond with each other and bur- uh, help carry each other's burdens is when I hear somebody pray for something they're going through or somebody else um, uh, speak in such a way. So I want to offer some practical guidelines for prayer. And to some of you, these will be obvious. To others of you, th- these might be a little convicting. I'm not singling anyone out here. Just in case you think I am, I'm not. These are general prayer guidelines, all right? So first up, keep it relatively short. Jesus said, 
When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Look, in your private life, if you want to go pray for an hour, two hours, in your, in, in your prayer closet at your house, go for it. That's awesome. That's wonderful. But during a Sunday service, it's not, it's not good. It's not good. Because we want to allow other people to be able to pray as well. And if somebody prays for 10 minutes, then guess what? You used up the whole time. So now we're going to move on to the song. So, you know, we have a little bit more flexibility than that. But, you know, there is a truth to the fact that only so many people can pray. Uh, number two, be respectful to others. Uh, praying for somebody in the room, I think you've got to be a little careful about that. Right? You know, if Stacy starts praying for her mother and says, Oh, gosh, I, am, I pray that you change... I pray that you change my mother's heart. You know, she's been really hard-hearted this week. What is that? You want to have a conversation with the person on the other side of the room? Do it! Not during prayer, though, okay? You want to be respectful. Dear God, I pray for, I pray for Timmy Paul. I know he just wants to serve you, but he's such a jerk. This... This is, this is not respectful. You want to be respectful to the people in the room. And, uh, you know, um, keep in mind, too, that there are people online who are watching this right this minute. And there is a kind of a gap between when the, the Sunday service posts on, on YouTube and when it gets edited to just the teaching. So literally anyone in the world could hear what you say. <laughs> Potentially, at least for that little gap of time, I don't know what it is, like day or two days, when it's still online in its totality before it gets edited down. So it's good to keep it, it's just be respectful, right? That makes sense. Um, number three, keep private matters private. You know, confession is an important part of prayer, isn't it? Yeah, Jesus talked about uh, confession and you know, we see it in other scriptures. We see it in the Old Testament, Daniel 9 and Ezra 9 and Nehemiah 9, all the nines. Uh, you know, you find these incredible confessions. Confession is great, but it's not really fitting for a corporate time of prayer. Unless you're confessing something on behalf of all of us, okay? If you're confessing uh, that we as a group have sinned in some way and you want to ask God for forgiveness, right, that makes sense. But if you get up there and you say, man, I just... Oh, I cheated on my taxes, dear God, and, you know, it's just been watching porn again, and, um, you know, I kicked the dog this morning because I was stressed out on my way to church. It's like, look, we don't, we don't need to know all that, okay? We, we don't need to know all that. That's great for you to pray and confess to God. I think it's important, but at, in, a, in a public setting, that kind of private matters are not, are not really fitting. Um, and here, here's another one. Pray during your prayer as opposed to giving a speech about politics or about some other issue, right? The prayer time is for praying. Praise God, thank God, ask Him to help you, ask Him to help others. Uh, it's not a time to do a teaching. I'm glad you're inspired to do a, a teaching. That's great. But the prayer is not a time for a teaching. It's a time for a prayer um, in fact, one time, some of you will remember this, I don't know how many of you, but one time we had a duel in this very room. It was a Republican versus Democrat duel of prayers. And, uh, you know, this always happens as we get close to election time, you know, we get real passionate about our, our politics, and, you know, I think you want to you be passionate about politics, you want to vote, you want to do whatever, God bless you. It's just, this is kind of like a demilitarized zone right here. It's sort of like a neutral territory where we want to allow all the different isms in the room so that we can recognize the, the diversity and goodness of God and his family. So uh, anyhow, one time we had somebody kind of give like a political stump speech for a particular candidate disguised as a prayer. And we had another lady who uh, was visiting for the first time it's always the one that visits for the first time, right? And, uh, and she was just so infuriated by the, uh, the Republican uh, speech that was made disguised, that she disguised a Democrat speech as a prayer and fought back.
you're both welcome here. Okay? You're both wel welcome here. You know, your Christianity is above your politics. Christ is Lord before the president or the king or the Caesar. Right? And uh, so, yeah, pray during your prayer. Number five, remember you have an international family. We have brothers and sisters all over the world. Today is a great day to remember that because today of all days we celebrate the outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And on that day in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, there were people from all these different places. And in fact, what happened is on that day they spoke in these tongues which were understood languages of those people who were present. And so people were able to sort of synchronize in a, in, a, in a reversal of the Tower of Babel, if I could put it that way, and together hear about the marvelous deeds of our God. And so uh, it says in 1 Timothy chapter 2 that we are to pray for all people. This is 1 Timothy 2.2. 2, for kings and all who are in high positions that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. If you want to pray for the country, pray for the country. It's fine, right? Just keep in mind that there are brothers and sisters from other countries that are part of our family. I, uh, you know, right now, Russia is kind of the bad guy in the world. Well, I know a Russian who just got hit in the head with a bat because he's a missionary in Russia, and somebody didn't like his stand and his, what he was doing. And he was in the hospital for 10 days, and he had a concussion, and he had bruises, because after he got hit in the head with a bat, uh, he was unconscious. And in Russia, this happened some months ago, it's freezing cold. So then he nearly froze to death, too, and he got sick. And, you know, this guy, I, I, I don't want to give you his name or anything or details about him, but somebody that, that you know, we work with, uh, or at least I, I wor work with, or I know people that work with him, um, and... Um, you know, he's a Russian, so what? His country's doing some, whatever it's doing, but you know what? He is a brother in Christ. You know what I'm saying? So, like, our Christian identity has to supersede a lot of the, the chaos, and, uh, you know, it's easy to, to forget that when we live in such a big country as the United States of America that has so many benefits and so much um, uh, goodness in it. So, I, I did also want to mention that we have brothers and sisters right now tuning in from around the world from other countries. And there are people in this very room with connections to countries outside the United States as well. Let me see if I can list a few. The Dominican Republic. Some people in the room right now that have connections to the Dominican Republic. Um, oftentimes we have people here who are connected to Puerto Rico. Um, well, that's the same country, but a province. Okay. And then we have uh, Korea. Korea is often represented in the church. Uh, what about the Congo? We've got a couple from the Congo. I don't know. You've got, you don't want to sit next to your sister anymore. What's going on here? I, I was thinking Omar. He's like, doesn't look anything like Timmy Paul. All right. So we've got people from the Congo. We've got people with ties to Italy and Greece and uh, the Philippines, you know, both here and online. You know, probably some other countries, too. And so, look, what it says in Scripture is that uh, God uh, wants everyone to be in his family. That the call goes out to, not everyone responds to it, but that if uh, Jesus died, he died for people from every tribe, nation, and language, is what it says in Revelation 5.10, so, or 5.9. So, um, that's good to, to remember that. And then lastly, and most importantly... Because if we can't hear you, it does no good. Speak loudly and clearly. Uh, you know, and we like to have, typically we have music playing in the background. Uh, we didn't have that today, but we do usually have music playing in the background. There's something about music. You know, there's something about it. I want to show you an interesting verse. 2 Kings 3.15 says, But now bring me a musician. So this is the king asking Elisha for a word from the Lord. And Elisha says, bring me a musician. And when the musician played, the hand of the Lord came upon him, and he said, thus says the Lord, and he prophesied. There's just something about music that, you know, I think is good for, for setting the ambience, for setting the atmosphere for these things. But here's the problem. 
if we have any music on, and even if we set the volume to, to the lowest volume, we can't hear you unless you speak really loud during your prayer. So we ask that you speak up. Uh, in fact, we are going to be changing this. We're going to be changing this. We got this swanky wireless microphone, okay? And uh, starting next week, what we're going to do is when it's your turn to pray, you raise your hand and someone will bring you the mic. Now, when you receive the microphone, if you hold it like this, <laughs> you know what that's going to pick up? All the noise of the people in front of you and none of the noise coming here, right? So you have to point the mic at your face. You know, it doesn't have to be exact, okay? <laughs> but it has to be general, the general direction of where the sound is coming out. And then we will be able to hear you on the mic. And one of the big, one of the big issues we have and why we want to introduce this mic, other than so we can have the music and the prayer and, and have both, is because online uh, it's very hard to hear the prayers. Very, very hard. And we've, we've tried. We have these mics over here. You see that mic in the corner there? Uh, and then we've got another one over here. And, uh, you know, that, that mic is really great at picking up the front row here, right? In the front row there. But you people in the middle, you know, somebody coughs in the front row. We've just lost everybody in the middle, <laughs> right? It's, 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 it's been difficult to figure that out. So we're going to try, try this starting next Sunday, and uh, we'll see how it works. And hopefully it'll, it'll make it so people can hear you better and you can be able to um, contribute. And you know what? Those of you who pray... Those of you who have the guts to stand and speak to God before other people, I think that's awesome. I just want to say thank you for contributing because you know what? It is a family, and when multiple voices participate, you really feel the family effect, don't you? So thanks for those of you participating. All right, let's move on to the next one. Let's look at manifestations. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 says, Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast what is good. You see how this says here, do not quench the Spirit? We take this seriously. We want to do the opposite of quench the Spirit. We want to make space for the Spirit of God during our Sunday services. Uh, we want to uh, allow God to enter our service and do what He wants to do, which also is risky. If someone prophesies, and oh, um, this, this other part here, test everything, right? You do not have permission to turn off your brain because somebody's prophesying. You're supposed to test it. It says in 1 Corinthians 14 also that you're supposed to weigh what was said. So you, how do you test it? Well, you test it against the Scripture. If you don't read, your, if you don't read the Bible, you're not going to be able to know what it says. But you know, read the Bible and then test it against what the Bible says and this, this way, when somebody stands up and says, thus says the Lord, give me all your money, you know that she's a false prophet. Or if some man stands up and says, I am the second coming of Christ, bow before me. I mean, these are silly examples, but like, test everything, hold fast to what is good. Don't quench the spirit. Don't, don't say, oh, this is too risky, so I, we're not going to allow it. No, we don't want to do that. We want to allow it, but we also want to encourage you, want to empower you to test and hold fast to what is good. Um, let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I, I don't have really the, the full time to get through everything here, but I do want to at least read a few verses of 1 Corinthians 14 and talk about what the Scripture says about tongues and interpretation. And so it says, Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Do you see that in verse 1 there? It says, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. Looks like these people are earnestly doing something. You know, I just have to wait and see what it is. Earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. The spiritual gifts are to be pursued. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, verse 2, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. All right, so as you know, probably, maybe not all of you, but I'll say it anyhow, tongues are speaking a foreign language. It's a foreign language that you don't already know. 
That's why it's a miracle. If you speak a foreign language that you already know, that's not tongues. That's just uh, speaking a language. This is great, you know, but it's just not this, okay? Um, and, you know, I understand that speaking in tongues sounds a little weird because we're all English speakers here. But, uh, you know, I just, want, I just wanted to, you to hear for a moment. So I, I have this ensemble cast here. Um, uh, I wanted you to hear what other languages sound like. Now, this is not going to be speaking in tongues. This is just going to be presenting other languages. And I want you to just hear and listen, okay? All right. Oh, you got to stand in front of the microphone. <laughs> you want to use the wireless? Ya mo petros beaste heasar imo vajisha ekolo vadabe alehein lemor ashe jahuda vesbe Jerusalajin kolan zod jadoa tedu veahasinu el de barai ki ha anashin ha ele tu Shikorin Hema Kasher Amarten. He Charles Shaot Bayom Ata. Apenandias Prokite Yafto Pu Ipotheke Meso to Profiti Ioil. Hastis Telefteas Imeras Le Otheos. Tha Ekhiso Apoto Pnevmamu. Pano se cafe idos, sarca, ke iisas, ke corasas, ta profiti tefsun, ke ineorisas, ta dun oramata, ke irondasas, ta dun oniera. Atape baombo nangai yamibali, pe baombo yangai yabasi, na cosope la bangon damboya elimo nangai, na mikolowana, pe bakosakola. Pe nako pesa makamu isi ya komonisa makambo oyo eko ya kuna na likolo. Pe bilembo na mabele awa na se. Makila pe moto pe londende ya milinga. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. And it will be that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Did you recognize that one? Yeah. Okay. Dieu l'a ressuscité en le délivrant. Dieu l'a ressuscité en le délivrant de lien de la mort, parce qu'il n'était pas possible qu'il fût retenu par elle. Car David dit de lui, je voyais constamment le Seigneur devant moi. Pasquilia Daula, Jersey, Chiching, Nimenzigi, Jidao, Jidoshi, Jenshide, Shangdi, Ba, Sugar and Chow, Gay Lee, Nimen Er, Nimen Trezai, Er and Bang Chusia, Ba Ta, Ding, Si Zai, Chi Si Zia, Shang Le, Shangdi, Jidao, Jiang Hui, Fa Shang, Jersey, por lo cual mi corazón se alegró, y sin gozo mi lengua, y aún carne descansará en esperanza, porque no dejarás mi alma en el Hades, ni permitirás que tu santo vea corrupción. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, let me, before you go, before you go, let's see. Uh, can you tell me what language he did? Hebrew. Hebrew with a Spanish accent. So that's a special case. What would she do? Greek. Greek. Bengali. 
Lingala. Lingala. What language does she do? English. All right. And what did Lydia do? French. Chinese. Chinese. Which kind of Chinese? Mandarin, Chinese? Mandarin Chinese. And what was that? Espanol. Espanol. Very good. All right. Thank you so much. And what did they read? Yeah, well, that was actually a trick, because that verse was quoting another verse. <laughs> Anybody know what they read? What chapter of the Bible? I'll give you a hint. Today's Pentecost. What's that? All right, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is what they're reading about how the Spirit came, and they spoke in tongues as, as the Spirit gave them utterance, and there were people from all these different places which, which one of you read all those different places? Was that Christine? Or who was that that read all the different places? Dwellers of all these different regions. Was that you? Oh, maybe we skipped that verse. <laughs> I was going to say, like, that's a hard verse in any language to do because it's all these different geographies. Um, so that's, that's what it sounds like when people speak in other languages. They each essentially read two sentences, two long sentences, because it's the Gospel or it's uh, the Book of Acts, which is like the Gospel of Luke, written by Luke, he, he uses long sentences. So two long sentences, uh, more, more or less, in each of those different languages. And uh, look, when all you speak is English, any language other than English sounds weird. Okay? I get it. Um, but that's not a good reason not to pursue speaking in tongues or to learn another language, either of those things. Uh, these tongues... Uh, once again, in 1 Corinthians 14, I want to come back to this. It says, in verse 2, it says, For the one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. Speaking in tongues is to God. And the uh, interpretation, therefore, the translation of the tongue, also should be to God. Uh, sometimes people want to speak to the people. Thus says the Lord. This sort of a thing. That's prophecy. Prophecy is great. Uh, speaking in tongues and interpretation is great, but they're not the same. So I just wanted to point that out in verse 2 here. Verse 3, on the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people. So the speaking in tongues is to God and the prophecy is to people for their upbuilding, encouragement, and consolation. For one who speaks in a tongue builds himself up, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. For the one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets, so that the church may be built up. Did you notice how different each of these languages sounded from each other? It really sounded different. And there are thousands of languages in the world. Um, and these tongues, <clears throat> when somebody does speak in tongues, um, they're languages. So I thought that would be a helpful illustration. When it comes to the question of who interprets the tongues, the Bible says it both ways. It says in 1 Corinthians 12.10, to another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another, various kinds of tongues, to another, interpretation of tongues. So in one case, it says the speaking of tongues and the interpretation of tongues. And the way it sounds from 1 Corinthians 12 is that it's one person speaking in a tongue and a different person interpreting the tongue. In 1 Corinthians 14, 13, it says, Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. So it sounds like the same person who speaks in the tongue also interprets the tongue. Look, I'm not going to make some hard and fast rule about what the Spirit of God is allowed and not allowed to do. All right? The Spirit of God is going to do what it wants to do. Um, but I think when it comes to our Sunday services, from a practicality point of view, we have instituted a policy where the same person who speaks in tongues also interprets the tongue because over and over in 1 Corinthians 14, the Apostle says that we should not have tongues in a gathering like this and not have it interpreted. So from a practical point of view, if somebody starts speaking in tongues... I don't know how we figure out, like, if, if an interpreter's in the house, <laughs> who can understand that, right? Uh, I don't know how to, how to handle that. So what we do is we, uh, as far as our gatherings go, uh, we stick with this right here. 
recognizing that, you know, maybe other things could happen if the spirit moved in a different way. But, you know, as far as how we do it here, we have uh, the same person who speaks in the tongue also interprets the tongue. And if you want to speak in tongues in your private life, that's, that's, that's excellent. That's not what I'm talking about today, though. I'm talking about in the church service, how do we do things here? It says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26, giving us a little bit more instruction here. It says, What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. That is a key element, a key instruction for everything that we do during this prayer and manifestation time. We want to be submissive and open to the Spirit of God moving within us. And at the same time, we want to recognize that the point of the time is for the building up of the saints. That's why blowing somebody out of the water on the other side of the room is inappropriate for this time. Because it's not building up. You want to confront somebody, do it in the hallway. You know, but like don't do it during the prayer and manifestations time. And don't disguise it as a prophecy. You know, that's even worse, right? So it's really a mindset that says, okay, I'm going to contribute. I want to bring what I have. I want to allow God to work through me. And I want to do it in a way that is edifying, that builds up, that is for the common good. Verse 27, if anyone speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at the most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. That's what it says. That's what we do. So if you've already heard three people speak in tongues and interpret, guess what? it's not appropriate for you to do it. You know what I mean? Because it's in a meeting, this is again, just in a meeting in your own life, or if you have a, a small gathering of friends, they're, they're, the rules are different, right? Um, but in a meeting, two or three is what the Scripture says, and make sure that it's interpreted. Verse 28, But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others weigh what is said. You see that? Weigh what is said. You're always supposed to be listening and, and comparing it to Scripture. Um, verse 30, If a revelation is made to another one sitting there, let the first be silent, for you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Verse 32 is interesting to me. The spirit of the prophet, of the, of the, prof, the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Verse 33, For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. What is confusing? When two or more people are speaking at the same time. That's confusing to me. I don't understand. I can, li I can kind of like tune others out and just listen to one, but I can't listen to two people talk at the same time. Maybe some of you can, but I bet once we get to three people at once, you can't anymore. All right? Your brain only can do so much. So to avoid confusion and to maximize the building up and the edification, we ask that only one per person speak at a time. Now, sometimes two people start speaking at the same time. That happens. right? One of those people has to yield so the other one can, can do what they uh, are being inspired to do. And then the other one can speak immediately after that. And it says in verse uh, 32... And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. That tells me that you're not out of control when you're speaking by the Spirit. You're not possessed. You're not taken over and have no say in when you speak. <clears throat> the Spirit is, is subject to the prophet. It's not going to control you. Now, there are spirits that are going to try to control you, but that's not the Spirit of God. That's a different spirit. We don't want that spirit during... <laughs> <clears throat> during our time here. All right, so by way of conclusion, here are some guidelines for manifestations. Once again, keep it relatively short. You can speak in tongues in private for hours if you want, or you can prophesy and do, do whatever you want to do. But when it comes to the meeting, keep it relatively short, short so other people have a chance. Tongues must be interpreted. Tongues and interpretation are spoken to God, whereas prophecy is directed to the people. Let all things be done for building up, and the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. No other part of our Sunday service freaks people out, especially visitors, as much as our prayer and manifestations time. I know that. 
But it's like, do we just quench the spirit as a result of people being feeling awkward or like what's going or confused or like what, what was that, right? No, I don't think so. I think you, I think you embrace it. You say, look, God is in this place. He is moving among people in a non-controlled way. We're not, we're not controlling what's happening. God is moving. People are getting inspired. They're speaking. And some of you are reading Scripture too. If you're going to read Scripture, the same kind of things apply. Be considerate for those that are around you. If you want to read an entire chapter of the Bible, do it before church. Okay? <laughs> Keep it relatively short. Uh, you know, and what's really great to read, if you want to pick a Scripture reading is something that praises God or something that thanks God. The Psalms in particular are very good for this. Other scriptures are great too. But, you know, the idea is to to contribute to the entire worship experience um, rather than say, look at me, I'm so awesome. I can do this, I can do that, right? We don't want to have that kind of attitude here. So, in conclusion, speaking in tongues is weird. (laughs) But it's biblical, and it's awesome. So uh, Ruth and I once visited this, uh, this weird town in Texas called Austin. <laughs> Have anybody ever been to Austin, Texas? Anyhow, in Austin, Texas, they have this uh, slogan, keep Austin weird, right? Yeah. And they're like, they just rally behind it. They're like, yeah, we are different, and we're cool because of that, and we're not going to change it. And I think that kind of applies here. You know, like, maybe other churches don't do it, but it's biblical. We want to do what the Bible says. We're, like, we're not joking around when we say we're a Bible church. Like, no, we really want to do what the Bible says. And we want to allow God to move in a way that happens. And look, they spoke in tongues on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. They spoke in tongues at Cornelius' house in Caesarea. They spoke in tongues at Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. In 1 Corinthians, we read about how they spoke in tongues in Corinth. Why not Latham? <laughs> Right? Why not Latham? So, in conclusion, speak up. Be courageous, but also be considerate. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you are a God who works with us. We thank you that you are someone who inspires us. And what a gift it is to be able to hear prayers and scripture reading and exhortation and prophecy and speaking in tongues and interpretation during our services. Um, We pray and ask that you would help us to do it in a way that honors you and we ask that as we leave this place that you would bless us in our week as we endeavor to serve you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.